Well, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 304 of F Stop Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week, I had a very fun time chatting with longtime nature photographer and NAMPA board member, Hank Erdman. Hank has some awesome actionable tips for you to improve your approach to finding unique images in the field using your five senses, which is a large part of what we covered today in our chat. So sit back and enjoy our conversation. I also wanted to take a quick moment to thank our latest Patreon supporters, Jared Harris, Martha Montiel, Jan Hillert, and Jana Mengi. These four generous souls have stepped up to financially support the show. Since we operate on the value for value model here on the podcast, I hope listeners take the time to support us on Patreon at the value that they feel is fair. I personally think anything more than zero is fair if you get anything out of it. Thanks in advance for helping us out. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Hank Erdman. All right, Hank Erdman, it is great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, When you reached out to me with some of your ideas, I got really excited because I think there's a lot to talk about today, and I think uh, what you have to say is going to provide value, so super appreciate it. Well, Hank, for for people that aren't familiar with you and your photography, would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I'm a a photographer, that great nature photography mecca of the Chicago suburbs. Um. (laughs) Actually, that, that there is some truth in that. We have an amazing uh, uh, set of native forest preserves in the Six Color County area, uh, and there's a wealth of places to to photograph here. So, and you guys also have a, a pretty amazing botanical garden as well. We do. We've got we've got the Chicago Botanical Garden, which is neat. We've got uh, the Morton Arboretum, which I'm. I'm not going to get into, but I'm persona non grata there now. We we helped start a nature photography program there that was really, okay. really wonderful. And they decided that a wedding and event in their nature or their, their um, education center was more profitable than teaching classes in photography and art. It's still kind of, gotcha. it's still kind of going, but gotcha. I, I sort of okay. rebelled against it, so. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they said see you later, and I said, <laughs> You're "Like I think I'm good." <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been a, jeez, most of my life. Um, it actually started as a young kid. I was a guy with always had a camera in his hand, uh, including the uh, the little Instamatics so one I melted on the back <laughs> shelf of a car window, and I kind of just sagged. Um, but uh, my dad was a printer. He had a little printing shop. And I kind of got into the photographic end of uh, printing and worked in that for a while and then did something else. But I worked in a place, uh, a manufacturing place that I kind of conned my way into being their <laughs> photographer. Uh, and 40 some years later, here I am. Wow. So, are you, so you're still doing that? No, I, I, I don't do commercial work anymore. Um, oh, okay. I worked for a, a neat little switch manufacturing company in, in the Chicago suburbs and had one of the best bosses of my life. Uh, so that was very positive. And then made my break, big break to, to go to AT&T. I got laid off and, you know, the first thing they get rid of is creative. Uh, and then I went to uh, McDonald's Corporation and shot pictures of people stuffing their faces. That lasted <laughs> about eight years and got laid off from there, too. Again, when they dumped the creative services thing, it finally said, enough of this corporate stuff. And I went on my own, uh, which was really an excuse to get back into nature photography, which is where I started, one I really love. I ran a little tour and workshop company for quite a while. Um, Keying in on mostly half day, one day local workshops. And it really worked well until most of the clients who were camera club members uh, became camera club coaches and they were in our business. So <laughs> that happened. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that is a risk we take when we, when we, when we're really good at teaching yeah. is that our students end up surpassing us. <laughs> but many of those people are, still remain friends. So people to follow my newsletter and stuff like that. And 
so it's it's all good. Cool. It's you know it's all cyclical. And what uh, what exactly got you into nature photography specifically? Because I know you did a lot of product photography, but I'm curious, well, kind of what it actually got preceded you to, the this. product work. It was you know just something that was an interest. It was somewhat a, a means of documenting everything from ski trips to hikes to backpacking a lot of it in the upper Midwest. Um, and that's pretty okay. typical. M most of us came from some other profession. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Well, I think we'll definitely talk a lot more about kind of the documentary versus artistic mm -hmm. side of photography. Um, but first I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit on something very passionate about, um, you know, one of the things that, that I'm most excited to talk to you about is your, your process for finding images through the use of the five senses. Um, because I think that's a really fascinating approach to finding images that speak to you. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about that. That came out of a, a program. I would, you know, because I've done a lot of teaching in the area, um, especially with the Arboretum where, where we ran classes for 13, 14 years. Uh, and I did all the intro classes. I did other ones too, but for some reason I have a knack or, or a patience, I guess, with, with beginning photographers. So I taught that class almost exclusively for most of that time. And I would constantly get people asking me, you know, how did you see that? And I go, well, yeah, I don't know. I just did. Um, <laughs> and I started thinking about that. Um, first from the perspective of actually answering that question a little bit more intelligently. Um, and second from this might make a really good program. And it, it did both. Right. And it also doesn't frustrate the person asking the question. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, I, I started thinking about it and I said, well, first of all, I pay attention, which sounds oversimplistic, but I have a great belief in that when, it, when I notice something, when something grabs my attention, there's a reason for it. So I started thinking yeah. about that. Uh, and then I started thinking about, you know, what do we do when we're out there, whether we're photographing or just hiking or just, you know, enjoying mother nature, um, we're not just seeing it, we're experiencing it. And we do that through our senses mostly. And so that's that's kind of how it came about. Um, and some of them are, are pretty obscure. I mean, like the sense of taste. I once saw this really yes. neat fall, almost red, completely red leaved background with a sycamore tree in front of it. Instantly, the thought process when I looked at that was spaghetti and noodles, which is really <laughs> silly. But um, I said, hey, there's an image there. So, you know, that was the process I talk about is, you know, when you notice something, pay attention to it because there's a reason for it. And you, most of it's through vision, but certainly smell. Um, we're in a neat state park up in Door County, Wisconsin which is that peninsula that sticks out in the Lake Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a state park there called Peninsula. And there's a site um, along the bluff called Sven's Bluff. It was settled by a bunch of Scandinavians. And um, we're sitting there with a class and I'm getting this wonderful aroma just drafting up around me. Of course, I went looking for it. I told the class, uh, I'll be right back. And I walked down the, it's on top of the uh, hill, right? As, it, as you leave it, you go downhill about 100 yards. And at the site of one of the settlers that was there uh, long before it was a state park, were lilies of the valley that had naturalized in the forest in hundreds and hundreds of acres up. And it wow. is nature's perfume to the max. It's unbelievably. So that's how I found it. And I've made so many pictures in there and taken so many people there to shoot. And, you know, so it's things like that. Makes that makes sense. Yeah. So you've got, uh, you got taste, you've got smell. I mean, I think vision is obvious yeah. for most and of hearing. us. What about, yeah. How, how do you incorporate 
auditory so I'm, I'm photographing uh, just a forest scene at a local preserve. Um, and from eye level, it's, it's a, it's a medium bright overcast. And from eye level, it looks like one green on the forest floor. And I dropped a lens cap. And as I bent over about waist high, the, the light hit these. There's a plant that's common in the Midwest called mayapple or a couple other names for it. Um, but mayapple's a common one. And it's, it's a real flat leaf that's almost parallel to the ground usually. Um, and when I bent to that angle, the gray sky just lit it up like somebody flipped a switch. So I'm photographing <laughs> this and I'm really excited about this image. And I get this really strong impression to look over to my left. And I don't know, I thought I heard a, a bird or a, a, some kind of rodent rumbling through the underbrush, but it was so strong that I kept looking over to the left. I finally finished up the picture that I was initially, you know, excited about. And I walked over and I found a patch of another prairie uh, or a uh, Midwestern forest plant called prairie trillium, even though it's in the forest. Um, and they're very singular plants. They're hard to photograph because they only grow about a foot tall and they're really spread out. Uh, but they're really neat. Um, another name for our similar plants are wake robin and things like that. You'll find them all over the country or at least all over the east and the Midwest. Um, but I found a clump literally so thick and I've never seen them grow like that before or since. And I, I know exactly where that place is and I've gone back there and it's a truism that, you know, shoot it now because you'll never see it again. Uh, the plants are still there, but they've never grown back that thick. So it was a neat little pattern shot I made. So I got two shots in one in just those few little minutes just by paying attention to something that caught my caught my ears really more than my eyes. I, th I think that's one of the reasons why I love fall, fall photography so mm -hmm. much because Obviously, you've got the visual stimul stimulation from all the colors, but, you know, with the, the leaves falling, you got the sound of the quaking aspens that yeah. always, always draws my attention. And, you know, it's very nostalgic. And then you've also got kind of that, I don't, it's, I don't even know how to describe it, the, 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 the rotting. Um, the smell of decay. Yeah, the smell of decay. Like, it's just indescribable. But once you smell it, you Which know, is really a wonderful aroma. I mean, it's one of those things that makes yes. fall special. Yeah, yeah, and then trying to incorporate all of those things through a visual medium, I think, is an incredibly and wonderful, wonderfully challenging thing to do as a as an art, art artist. Yeah. You know. Um, so I, I don't know if you're. Are you um, are you familiar with Guy Tal's article on visual oh, yeah. inventories? I'm big Guy Tal fan. Kind of yeah. So. Folks and for, for people that haven't read that article, it's actually a free article on NPN, but um, it's basically he talks, it's, he's using ideas from mindfulness, which I think kind of gets a bad rap of like, you know, people conjure these images of people meditating and things like that. It's, it's not really like that. It's just being kind of more aware of your surroundings. But what I love about what he talks about in visual inventories is it's kind of using, talking about what you're describing but doing it in like a very practical way, like especially if you get stuck, you know, like, yeah. oh, I don't know what to photograph. So, you know, you take your backpack off, you sit down, you just chill, and then you just start making a mental note of different things that are, like you said, yeah. what is drawing your attention? Is it the well, sound yeah, of the one leaves? One thing I do when I do run into compositional um, questions, um, I, f I literally take a couple steps back from the tripod just mm. to get that physical separation. Uh, yeah. And then I ask myself the question, what caught your eye? And usually that keys you right into it. Plus, if you do that out loud and nobody's around, nobody will come <laughs> near you. Start talking to yourself. Oh, I'm very guilty of talking to myself in the field. <laughs> yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a really, it's a really great approach. And then, you know, like you can start incorporating some of those um, non-visual elements into your image. Like, okay, if the the wind is blowing the grasses, you can actually do a slightly longer exposure and bring that into your photograph in a creative way. So I think yeah, and, you know, like 
even the sounds of blowing things, grasses and leaves and stuff, if you photograph around the Great Lakes or on Midwestern prairies, you will either go nuts or you will learn patience as far as photography <laughs> goes. Because um, sometimes things don't stop moving. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I once, once mentioned that to a photographer, a local photographer here that is kind of involved with the prairie remnant saving project, or it's, it's saved now, but um, he scolded me. He says, oh, if you wait long enough, it'll stop. And I said, yeah, um, it'll get dark too. <laughs> so, you know, I get it, but, you know, sometimes you just got to say, okay, this is what Mother Nature is giving me. Um, right, it's an opportunity right. to be a little bit more artistic and be a little less representational and, and play. I mean, we're out there. That's what we should be doing. It's, it's supposed to be fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I try to keep absolutely. that in mind. I love it. I, and I've sworn more than a few grass stalks and, uh, um, four by five head cloth blowing in the wind and things like that. But usually I, I chill out and move on. Yeah, I think if if a scene or whatever is starting to frustrate you, it's like a good reminder to like take a step back and right. think about like why am I here to begin with? Oh yeah, to have a good time. Right. Okay, let's do that instead. Grab a gummy. Oh, <laughs> well, there's that too. Uh, depending on where you live, but um Yeah. Well, well, it's Illinois, you know. Right, yeah. So so kind of along those same lines, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about um, artistic sensory perception okay. and how we can leverage that in our process for making images in the field. Well, it, as with most of my programs, they are, you know, works in progress. And as soon as I give one, especially after I've given it many times, you know, all these ideas come up, oh, I got to add this, I got to change this. So they're constantly being updated. And when I started giving, um, what I call my five senses program, it's called experiencing versus seeing. And it gets into all those sensory perceptions stuff. I started thinking about, well, there's more than just our, our physical human senses. There are a lot of artistic senses or, or inspirations and things like that, that, that I started adding into this to the point where the show got to be about an hour and a half. And that's about <laughs> a half hour too long for most camera clubs. Um, so I, I basically split it in two. Once in a while, I still will do the whole thing, but uh, most time I'll give the first one and they'll sign up for the second one or I'll do the artistic one because that's kind of the one that's a little bit more fun. So I came up with six artistic senses. Um, and one is awareness. One is contrast because really I don't look for a given subject in the field. I look for contrast or I yes. notice contrast. I look for something that stands out against something else. And that's where images are made, you know? So, yeah. so contrast is one. Can we, uh, can I pause you there real sure. quick? Because I think contrast is something that people assume is light, right? And I think yeah. it's really important for people to so hear much that more. contrast can be like love and war. It can be like new and old. It can be um dead or alive i mean there's lots of ways to use contrast yeah color yeah um, of course yeah. texture yeah textures um, yep shapes uh, contrast in different patterns um yeah 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 i go through them all <laughs> yeah um, nice okay cool that's really what i look for um another one is simplicity um, especially when you teach novices and beginning photographers you know, the, and I was guilty of that. There's still times I, I fall into that trap. Usually I can recognize it. We all want to get everything in the picture. I know. Um, and it's, it's much like a painter. Um, they don't have to put everything in a picture. They just put in there what they want. Right. Well, we, we do the opposite. We take out stuff until it's just what we want. Right. So, so that's one. Uh, another one is a big thing for me is mystery. I love the sense of mystery. And there's a lot of different ways you can put that into a photograph. And it's neat. I had all these, these topics and I was working into this show. This is God, 10, more than 10 years ago. Um, and I kept coming trying to come up with catchy names for him. 
And then I pick up uh, a, a copy of David Ward's second book, Beyond the Landscape. Mm. And I am a huge David Ward fan. If you're not familiar with David Ward, he's a yeah. photographer out of the UK. He's the second coming of Elliot Porter, it's which very, is the highest compliment I can give anyone. He's very good. Um, I am one who preaches to the altar of Elliot. Um, can't help it. You know, intimate landscape in the Midwest. <laughs> so anyhow, um, he's got all these chapters in his, his book. One's beauty, one's mystery. And I'm going, aha, I found my names. So I kind of <laughs> stole them, but, you know, they're just words. Oh, well, it's concepts that he put into words that you already knew about. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, there's a great... Uh, photographer out of uh, Camden, Maine, named um, uh, okay. Tillman Crane, um, hmm. who used to shoot uh, his smallest format when he was shooting film was 11 by 14. Figure that out. Um, right. He's now shooting digital like everybody else. But uh, anyhow, he said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. I'm in that camp. Oh, we could probably talk about that for like two hours. And yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really want to, but. <laughs> so those are, those are my artistic perceptions. So it, you, you put those together um, with the, the human senses, the things that you notice, and then you put around some rules because I abhor rules. There are no such things in art. Well, there are certainly some strong guidelines, but there are no rules. Um, so when you put the, the the awareness together with some artistic concepts, it's pretty easy to make a good image. Oh, I'm sure lots of people listening are like, it's not that easy. <laughs> it gets there. Just, you know, it's practice. No, I'm with you. Like, it gets easier for sure. So I what, mean... what did John Shaw say? He says, you know, after you make 100,000 images, you're a photographer. <laughs> that. My Lightroom catalog's getting close to that. I get. I think that's about right. <laughs> Got that many slides, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, so kind of along those same lines again, I'm curious what practical tips you have for people who say that they don't have artistic eye, which, you know. Well, that's one of my pet peeves, because I used to say that in every time I- think I we all do, right? At some think point? about that, I go, ah, oh, that was so stupid. Um, <laughs> do have an artistic component. Um, there's a great book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain hmm. by a, a lady named Betty Edwards. Um, and she was in on some of the early research of left brain, right brain thinking. Um, and I, years ago, with my father-in-law, um, because he didn't want to go because he said he wasn't good enough. And that was one of the things he took up at retirement. It was actually pretty decent. Um, and the first half of the first day of a three-day class was all about this ref, left brain, right brain thinking. Uh, and I was fascinated. I'm sure my father-in-law was bored out of his mind. Um, but it really was a great class. It was on the local uh, Midwestern watercolor painter. Um, and so I bought, the, of course, I bought the book and read it and all that stuff. And there's a lot to that, you know, so it's, it's, it's like anything else. You can train yourself to be artistic. Now, I do believe, and I've, uh, through teaching all these uh, classes, one of the first things I would ask in a class is, what are your in artistic influences? And people would kind of look at me like, what? I says, well, do you have a parent or sibling or aunt or uncle that plays piano or plays guitar? or paints, even paint by the number, or scratches neat things in the sand. Um, you name it, those are those influences that we all have if we think about it. My dad was a graphic artist. In his day, they called them printers. But he, the neat thing is he could look at a set of lead type that's upside down and backwards and read it like you were reading a book. He was so used to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he knew how to put words in, in as far as shapes, not the words themselves, um, with designs to make a very appealing letterhead for a company or, you know, you name it, all that kind of stuff. So I, that's why they're now called graph gardens because they are artists. They, they just right. called something else before. So, so I have those influences. Like I said, my mom was a paint by number person. 
I can't believe those things actually have value when you find them in a flea market now. What are some other practical things that you think people oh, yeah. can take away if they are feeling like they're not artistic? Um, first of all, you know, I get on that, that 100,000 image things. Practice, 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 practice. And, and I tell people, you know, you, you can go out and practice looking. You don't look at something that catches your eye and think about how you would frame it up. And, and just yeah. continually practice that. It's like anything else. Uh, if you do it long enough, you're going to get pretty good at it. Um, and I really believe that. Well, I mean, it's interesting, right? I think through going through school, like the creative side of us gets kind of beaten down because it's, yeah. you know, it's not what teachers are necessarily looking for. And I think that's where like project based learning and things like that can really help people yeah, reignite yeah. some of their more creative, creative well, sides of things. And I think in I photography, know when I went. And then when I went to high school, I dream of being a chemist because I thought chemistry was you mix two things together and see if it blows up. <laughs> right. um, it's not that. They fooled me. It's all mathematics. Right. And uh, mathematics was drove me to fine art <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Math was not my strong suit. Gotcha. So, I, and I always have English teachers that, that knew if I were the, the writing I do would be turning in their graves. Probably happily, but yeah, I think for one way to kind of ignite people's creative side, if they don't feel like they have it is to maybe start working in projects or to start looking at their mm -hmm. work in terms of themes, because it forces you to kind of distill things yeah. down into it focuses your attention. Um, I know yeah. Brooks Jensen's a big proponent of projects. Uh -uh. Yep. And I get it, and I, I do that a lot. I mean, most of mine are ongoing obsessions more than projects. Uh, I am fascinated by nature's art leaves of their patterns and textures. I've actually done um, a couple of you know exhibits, print exhibits called The Art of Leaves. Um, That's cool. I have hundreds, if not thousands of images. Uh, ex exhibition was 40. I somehow pared it down to that. Yeah, see that that right there is a monumental task. And, and I also got a uh, an article in on landscape on the art of leaves uh, a nice. year ago, April. Oh, cool! Kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, I know that this is a, a touchy subject for some people. I even wrote an article about it on NPN about a year ago, and a couple of people like lost their minds. But um, you mentioned to me. The, uh, the question of what is art yeah. is, is a ridiculous one. And I'm curious if you can tell us kind of why you think that and then tell us kind of your own thoughts on what art really is. Yeah, well, it is and it isn't. You know, it's one of those, those unanswerable <laughs> questions. Um, mm. I, I really do believe art is in the eye of the hope beholder. Um, you know, if you say you're an artist and you say this is art, so be it. That doesn't mean I might like it there you or go. <laughs> that the multitudes might like it. There um, you go. But, you know, you know, you know I'm not going to have that argument because it's worthless. I'm not going to waste my time on it. Uh, and, you know, well, why go around deflating people if they want, you know, there's a lot of room out there for artists. So you know, I, I kind of think that question is silly. You know, there was a, a, a print from a German photographer, I can't remember his name, it started with a G, his first name was Andreas or Andreas, something like that. And it was a gray road or some kind of gray thing and green grass in about a one-to-one -one proportion. And I've never seen anything so boring in my life, but the guy sold it for 800 grand or something. I mean, he made a fortune off those prints. Right. So, you know, who am I? Yeah. yeah I'll yeah. take the 800 grand for something like that, but. Yeah. Remi whatever. Uh, uh, reminds me, um, like, you ever watched, uh, what's that show called? Daredevil? I think it was Daredevil. There was a, like a villain in Daredevil. He was like this, um, this really big guy and he was an art collector also. Oh, really? No, I haven't and seen he, that. And he had these, like, super, 
like minimalistic abstract paintings. And of course he was buying them for like millions of dollars. This reminds me of, of that kind of stuff where it's like, you look, look at it and you're like, it doesn't do it for me, but yeah. man, if it does something for you, that's really cool. Well, it's like you know, in our class in college, I had a professor that showing some Jackson Pollock images. And uh, he walked past me and I must have had a bewildered look on my face because <laughs> he goes, what's the matter? You don't like it? And I says, I don't get it. And he said, that is your problem. And it's one of the best things that our teacher ever taught me. He said, don't try to get it, appreciate it. He mm. said, look at the, the form, the shape, the color, the textures. I go, oh yeah. Uh, and now, you know, one of my favorite things in the world is to make abstracts. So, um, lesson learned and quite well and point taken. So, yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. And it is, it's a great explanation. I also like what you said at the start though. Like just because it's art doesn't mean it's good. Right. Like, yeah. Or it yeah. doesn't mean we all should like it. I mean, I've been, I've been preaching that a lot. You know, it's like you get into street photography, you know, yeah. a lot of street photography prints have sold for a lot of money over the years and I appreciate them and I appreciate the moment. You know, I use a lot of Cartier Bresson quotes all the time, but they just don't excite me. Not that right. not to put on a wall. Right. Well, fun fact, Cartier Bresson actually quit photography because it was too boring for him. But... Yeah. I, I do remember reading that. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, well, so interesting kind of back on this definition of art idea, um, cause this is a topic that comes up a lot and I love talking about it. So it seems to me that the definition of art is fairly broad. Like you said, it's, if you say it's art, it's art. Um, and then for entry, um, for being an artist or for art existing is basically zero. There is no bar of entry. However, um, I think there's, like photographers, especially, I feel like in myself too, I've always revered artists as being, you know, kind of like this quote unquote, you know, greater than kind of entity, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is an artist, like they're put them on a pedestal. So do you think there's a danger of putting artists on a pedestal as it relates to our, our own pursuits as artists? Uh, I think the only danger is if you put yourself on a pedestal, <laughs> you know, if, it, if you, uh, let that get uh, the best of your ego. I mean, we all have one. We would do this if we did, but um, you kind of keep it in check a bit. So I, I don't know if there's a great danger in that because the phonies usually get found out. I think they do. Um, but, uh, well, you know, there's an old, uh, one of my favorite comics, who's an artist in his own right, was George Carlin. And one of my favorite quotes from Carlin was, you nail together two things that have never been nailed together before, and some schmuck will buy it. So you know, there is that part of art. Um, that is true. So like I say, I, I, again, I do this, I come from the point, this is supposed to be fun. It should be enjoyable. Sure, there are frustrations at times. Um, I've learned to get past a lot of that. You know, having been in this for quite a while, 40 some years, um, you gain some perspective that, you know, it's the old quote, you know, when, when somebody turns 20 something, gee, dad, I didn't know you were that smart. Um, time gives you knowledge. Um, so you, you learn some things, you learn what to really work on or obsess over and other things you learn to, you know, take them as they are, take them as mother nature gives you for nature photography, at least. So I'm, I'm kind of lucky. I have you know, fairly thick skin. Um, w when I came up with photography, the, the, the whole business was you do a book if you really want to be famous. Uh, almost did one. I was two and a half years into a book project when they canceled it. Oh, man. Uh, what? Well, yeah, long story. Brown trout. Um, uh, we were doing a book on uh, Michigan. But we, we sold them a lot of calendar images, so we made up for it. Uh, but you know, it was publishing, um, and it was stock photography. Yeah, you know, where we used to have a hundred or fifty dollar minimum, depending on the client. 
Now I'm selling images for 10 cents for God's sakes. But, I, know. You know, I, I refused to do that for 10 years or more and finally said, well, I'm not going to change it by not doing that. You know, I'll take my 10 cents when they come from. It's not a lot of money, but it's beer money, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, that's a whole other, I mean, a whole young, other ball of wax. There's so many photographers that thought, you know, their stock image portfolio was going to be there. And sadly, it, it, it hasn't been for some of them. Yeah. I mean, going back to this idea of artists and this definition of artists, I think it's interesting. I was, a, I was in a very heated exchange with some photographers recently about this idea because uh some people have like they take offense to um not being called an artist and then yeah. refuse to be called an artist they just want to be called a photographer and like why is that any less than being an artist and it's just yeah. interesting like how we get hung up on these uh, these definitions of kind of what we are or what we aren't and at the end of the day i feel like some of it is a little bit pedantic and yeah it's like hey man we all just enjoy making photos and yeah that's well, you know, fine <laughs> you're right I, I have noticed that in the last year or so where some of those arguments seem to be going on uh and again and i can think of so many 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 ways to profitably spend my time that is not <laughs> one of them yeah. um so call yourself what you want um you know I'll be happy to address you that way. Yeah, I, I always thought as artists um, were kind of a, in the upper guard of society, I guess. And, you know, part of that was politically, my dad and I were opposite. I'm very liberal, and he was, he was an Eisenhower Republican, I guess you'd call him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I used to just love tweaking him. Tweaking his uh, whatever, you know, talking about artists and how great they are. He says, oh, damn, artists are crazy. And he said, yeah, you are. <laughs> so, it is interesting. This, it, it's know? just not worth arguing about. But, you know, yeah, I get it. Um, I think some of that also may come out of, you know, for so long, photography struggled to be, you know, in some circles, included as an art. Um, it's just just frost my mind but yeah. I, well I, I was in a gallery for a long time and in there were 10 of us that actually ran or started with seven um and i had a guy come in one day and he looked around and he says all you have in here is photography i said yeah it's a it's a photographic gallery he says do you have any art <laughs> i, I uh, asked him to leave politely <laughs> yeah uh, I, I didn't think that was funny yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, there are people out there that see photography as, you know, kind of like on the lower echelon of the arts, and yeah, I wonder, it's, it's interesting, right, because, like, when I think about what I do as a photographer versus, like, what, I don't know, like, a very, very, very good um, actor, or, I don't know, you know, yeah. like, a sculptor, like, I just... For me, it's it's really or a musician like musicians the ultimate, and maybe that's part of the, the, the faultiness and the comparisons is like, well, yeah, you're not good at that, so of course you're gonna think it's awesome, but um, I just feel like there's so much more involved in some of those arts, yeah. but I think that's sometimes that's not fair, you know what I mean? Well, just, think about it, you know, not everybody can paint, you know. I'm right. a good, I'm a good uh, example of that because I wanted I wanted to paint, well. I don't have any talent for it. I mean, I can do okay copies of, yeah, I can't. of others' works, but Me neither. I can't translate my photographs to painting. I I just no. have to be too literal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not everybody can sculpt. Not everybody can play an instrument. All, all these other art forms, you have to learn them. Uh, photography, any idiot can pick up a camera. It doesn't mean they're going to take a good photograph, but they think they can. So if you've ever done art shows... How many times have you heard, oh, I could shoot that? Yeah, or like, well, oh, you could well, if you like, had the gear and the training photo, and the time. I have a photo just like that one. Let me show yeah. it to you. <laughs> yeah. And out yeah. comes the iPhone. Yeah. But I mean, to your don't point, do like, any, anymore. anyone can pick up a paintbrush too. You know, the yeah. tool is kind of irrelevant. 
I think it's just, I think photography is, and for better or worse, it's a little bit more accessible in terms of, yeah. you know, Well, producing. again, I think it's, uh, anybody can pick up a paintbrush, but they usually don't. Just about yeah. everybody takes pictures. Right, 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 so, right, right. I think that's part of it. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, either way, yeah. I mean, I, I'm i personally kind of in the camp of like, okay, call it, I'll, I guess I'll call myself an artist. That's fine. I'm like, but I'm not, me personally, like, I like to keep things pretty, pretty humble. Like, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm an okay photographer. Whatever. I go it's back fine. and forth. I use both <laughs> terms. The only time I really think about it is sometimes when you say photographic art, it's like you're making some exception to include photography. And I mm. hate that. Mm. Um, so I try not to do that. It's like, I refuse to word, use the words fine art anymore. In fact, you mentioned in your note that, that ask me anything uh, with Brooks on uh, MTN oh, yeah, the other day. I asked question. him something like that. And he had a snide remark, which I expected. Well, I, I want to talk about that because okay. this whole idea of art and photography, especially nature photography, I think is a really... Oh, it's a sticky wicket. It's something that I like to talk a lot about, and it's something I personally struggle with myself in my own photography and also in evaluating other people's images. And like you said, Brooks Jensen just did an AMA or an Ask Me Anything on mm -hmm. NPN. And I asked him a very specific question about this because he had a a really interesting article in one of his Lenswork magazines about what he calls orgasmographs, which is basically like... Yeah. If you could just imagine like a really pretty picture of the landscape, right? I think that's what he's kind of describing, which, mm -hmm. you know, when you think of landscape photography, I think that's what most people picture is like, oh, it's a stunning sunset or sunrise or whatever, or a beautiful water waterfall scene with yeah. wild wildflowers, whatever. And, but then he like talks about how like, but then there's other types of photographs that are not that. They're more subjective in nature and they're more artistic and personally expressive. But it's like, for me, it's like, how can you realistically differentiate between those two types of photographs without first having a conversation with the photographer who created them to fully understand what the intent was behind the image? Like, sure, I'm guessing some people making quote unquote orgasmographs we're just trying to make a representative, you know, documentary photo of a beautiful scene. But I'm also guessing that some people that are making those types of images are also trying to translate to the viewers something about their personal connection with nature or something that they see in the beauty of nature that maybe other people don't see. So it's like, how do you differentiate between those, uh, man? You know, again, it's not something I really try. Um, <laughs> Come on, man. No, no, just from the standpoint of how do you put some of those things in words, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong in taking a picture of nature's wonder just for the sheer beauty of it. That's another one of those artistic concepts. You know, celebrate nature because it's definitely worth celebrating. It makes me feel good to see things like that, especially to shoot things like that. So... In some cases like that, I don't really want to change it. I just want to, wow, isn't this wonderful? Take a look. Right. Check this and, out. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. And, and then there's other times that, yeah, you want to put on those quote unquote artist hats um, and do something different. And I think for me, um, I want to do it all. You know, I don't know if that's greeny or it's just like, I don't want to get bored with one or the other. Um a long time ago, uh, so this had to be, I think, the mid-90s, when Freeman Patterson came out with his book, uh, Photo Impressionism and the Subjective Image. A good friend of mine, who's still a good friend, um, came running into a camera club. Me, I've been a member of this one club in the Chicago area for 40-some years. Um, he said, Hank, Hank, check this book out. And that's what the book was. And I remember time I was really stuck in my composition. And I look at those images now, and there's nothing wrong with them, but except that they're mechanically all the same, you know. Hmm. Formulaic? When, yeah, because back when you're starting out, you're learning 
the rule of thirds. And I refuse to use the word rule in, in any of my classes. I the somewhat guideline of thirds or corners or eighths or one sixteenths, you know. Um, you know, it's a starting point. Use it as such. Um, so yeah, when when he gave me that book, I was in this rut. And there are pictures in there of a stack of jeans folded. There's, you know, pictures of things moving and out of focus or very selective focus. And to me, I, it was like a, an epiphany. I said, this is right. Because all of a sudden now I had, I had an ability or the opportunity when something wasn't working traditionally or the light was bad, here's something else to do. It's not that I don't want to, I'm out there. Um, cause back then I was still working full time as a photographer, commercial, uh, corporate. Um, but you know, you go to Door County, Wisconsin in the winter and you just may hit 10 straight days of deep, dark, overcast gray. Right. Um, so you either go to the bar or you go to the shoreline and shoot ice, you know, <laughs> or a right, little bit of both. That sounds like. Great woodlands conditions. Yeah, yeah there, there's there's always something out there if you look hard enough. And maybe it won't be the greatest image in the world. But again, it's practice. It's it's learning to see, learning to, to simplify, learn all those things that we talk about. And, you know, it's, it's stuck with me over the years. So I'm still doing this somehow. So, like, in your mind... Maybe maybe this is the way to ask the question. So as the photographer who likes to create both representative images and subjective or quote unquote artistically expressive images, how do you tell the difference between the two when you're creating them? Oh, uh, it's it's probably intuitive. I mean, again, you do this long enough and you, your brain just you know, you don't go through a checklist of all these things. It just puts them together. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, you know, we, uh, a few years back, we saw Yo-Yo Ma at one of the, the outdoor concert place in the northern suburbs called Ravinia. And that man never, ever looked at that instrument. But he, w he was one with it. I mean, he was so into it. And, of course, he's one of the greatest ever. Um but, you know, it, it's a kind of same thing with photography. It doesn't matter who you're making that image for. Or if you have nobody in mind, you're making it for yourself, which is what I do most of the time. You know, I don't, you know, purposely sell to publications anymore. Plus, they don't buy a lot. But, I mean, that used to be part of the thought process is, is I have, do I have room for a masthead? Do I have room for this? Uh, right. Will type look good coming, you know? Right, is there room over here for some right. words? Yeah. I don't think about that anymore. In truth, I didn't think about it a whole lot. But I did think about it occasionally, and sure. sometimes it actually resulted in in a magazine cover. But, um, yeah. You know, I make it for what the subject seems to want, so whatever interpretation I get out of it, and I really don't worry about other people's work. I mean, you look at guys' work. Um, a lot of it is abstract in the form of it's subtracted from the greater environment. Not a bill there. And there's some, but not a lot of it is the, uh, what are, one of my friends calls a hoop, a weebie, weebie jubi or something like that. He be GB stuff with, you know, a lot of movement or ICM or some, that's another thing I think is really cool. We've been doing camera movement shots for 40 years. Uh, most of it getting paid in camera clubs, but nonetheless, and now they came up with a name for it. I think that's really <laughs> <Right>. cool. <laughs> An acronym, ICM. You know, as you were talking about that, the intuition thing kind of struck a chord with me because I was thinking about a couple of instances in my photography journey where that switch went off for me, where like, if you, when you know it, you know it, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, like, oh, this is more than just a representative image of a beautiful thing. Like there's 
there's something, there's an additional layer of something here that I'm trying to convey through this subject and how I'm interacting with it with the camera. I had a, actually this last fall trip I did, there was one specific evening where I had that happen to me where I came across this, I mean, it's kind of silly, but I came across this mud puddle full of fallen aspen leaves, but it, it was on a dirt road and, you know, the dirt road was super straight. And then at the end of the road, the clears were tree, the trees were clear. Jeez. Yeah. And you could see like some really amazing light hitting these trees in the background. So I got super, super, super low and I was just photographing the reflection of the, of the water and the leaves floating in it, but it looked like fog floating through a forest. Like it was, it, yeah. and so for me, it was like, oh, there's like, this is more than just a reflection. Like it also has this other idea attached to yeah. it. Yeah. Well, so. I, I get that too, quite often, you know, I've got a shot of a very gray winter day, um, deep, dull overcast, but it's snowing. So I slowed it down to eighth of a second, somewhere around there, a half a second, it, intentionally getting movement in the snowflakes because it was windy too, they were blowing, um, but not so much that they blurred out into just a fog. So you could actually see the streaks Yeah. Um, and shot it with a, with a crab apple tree and a crab apple at the Arboretum and you know, but the distant ones have gone more gray because they're way in the back and the closest one's much darker. And that's where you see the snow streaks in front of the darker stuff. And it just hit me. It's ghostly. So I call yes. that ghost snow or a ghost tree or something like that. Right. I've sold a few prints of that. I really like that image. So yeah, those things yeah. sometimes do come through. Uh, and then the rest of the time, I would say most of the time, I've got an attitude like that professor that said, don't try to understand it um, <laughs> because you know, I don't, if I get, if I get a reaction onto somebody looking at one of my images, whether it's on a screen or an exhibition, you know, but you know, you name it, if, if I get some reaction, that's what I want, you know, and if their impression is different than mine, so be it. Um, yes. So I, I don't have that kind of uh, you know, an ego that says you've got to see or think what I, I did, you know. Right. I could care less. No, I you think know, it, actually, um, for me anyway, like that's actually when I'm the most excited is when a viewer gets something out of a photograph that I yeah. wasn't like putting out, like it wasn't my intent at all, but it they took it a very certain way or they interpreted it a very certain way. And I'm like... I didn't even see that, but if yeah, and that means they're looking at it. Yeah, means they're looking at it and looking really at cool. it closely. So, yeah, I think that's a really cool phenomenon. Yeah. Actually, it, it's like the gallery went to the thing I would do every time we open an exhibit. I would watch people as they walked around the room, and notice which pieces they stopped at, and really looked at, and then I would go and look at it again. It was pretty obvious, you know why they were stopping in some and why they were passing other ones by. And it does translate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so not to not to put you further on the spot, but um, I would love for you to tell us uh, why you make photographs. <laughs> um, that's, I think I could, I could say it's who I am. It's what I do. It's really that simple. Um, like I said, I, I wanted to do other things when I found out um, they were math based. I, but I was always interested in art, you know, um, just from very early age, you know, I, I, can, I can remember my dad taking me down into the basement washroom. He had painted a light bulb red and he contact printed with, with orthochromatic materials, uh, you know, and then took it out, took and made the print, fixed it. You know, when I watched this all happening, I was six, seven, eight years old, something like that. I was fascinated by it. Um, then we took it out in the sun before it was fully fixed and brown toned it. Um, mm. I've never forgotten that. So, right. again, we're a product of our imagination. We're a product of our environment, our experiences, our prejudices, 
our our education, all this stuff goes into making you who you are. And it just seems like every, everything pushed me towards art. Um, photography is where I found my my biggest kind. I'm also into artistic cooking uh, and wine. I worked for as a wine consultant for six years. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was fun. I needed a job towards, you know, I, I took six years off. I, I retired from all that about a year and a half ago. Um, so I, I, I say now that photography has gone from an occupation uh, to back to an avocation because hmm. I'm not worried about the monetary aspects anymore because there are, aren't many, but you know, um, I don't need that. Yeah. You know, so. Gotcha. I can just concentrate on art and sharing what I know and doing things like that. So that's kind of the crux of it, but that's what I do. I love it. And photography is a way of, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of sharing that whatever artistic talents I have. Yeah, and obviously you're getting something out of it in return as well. Yeah, um, if it's nothing more than a attaboy, that's wonderful. That's that keeps me happy. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like, um, there's you know, because people get slammed for chasing likes and comments on social mm -hmm. media, right? But it's like, at the end of the day, you know, as we go through life, there's actually not that many ways to actually get authentic, genuine, I don't know, like feedback to like, yeah. Oh, you're, you're doing a good job in life. So I think the arts sometimes is a great way to, to seek that out. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't count likes. Um, yeah, I do know when I get a bunch, you know, um, but I still use Facebook. Um, you know, it's, there are bad things about it, but there are good things about it. And it's, again, yeah. it's a way of sharing. I know there's some some names like Daiking is off of it completely now, which is too bad because I love seeing his images. Um, but you know, whatever platforms you're out there and you're comfortable with, yeah, that's what we do. And again, like yeah. I say, it's a way of sharing stuff. And you know, I'll be honest, it's nice getting those attaboys. You know, nice being complimented. Totally. So, yeah, I mean, come on, We're makes on the here, world man. go around. Yeah. So <clears throat> speaking of like reaching people and, you know, the medium of communication, uh, tell us a little bit about the newsletter that you put out. So I started uh, a newsletter back when I was doing my little workshop tour company, which we called Lake Effect Photographic Adventures. Lake Effect, you know, is a big thing in the, the yeah. Great Lakes. That's how Buffalo gets keep getting pounded this year. It's right. all Lake Effect snow. Northern Indiana gets that too, by the dunes in Southwestern Michigan, which is also really good wine country. Um, so I get over there a lot. Um, it's neat, but we start, I started that as, is kind of a putting a little bit more into our, our brochures, uh, on our, our events. And, um, then I started doing the newsletter to find, you know, people to go to the events. And then I stopped doing the events. I got rid of the, I, I basically shut the company down in 2013 because it wasn't working anymore and I needed to find a job. That's when I got the wine job for a few years. Um, and I still do some workshops. I do a couple events for Nanpa on, on occasion for um, their regional events. I do an annual uh, workshop up in Door County, Wisconsin at a really neat place called The Clearing. It was started by a landscape architect way back in the 30s or something uh, who designed most of the Chicago parks uh, that at the time were wonders of the world. Still are, they've, they've redone a few of them. Um, so that, that's kind of where that the newsletter came from. And early on, you know, I've been using Photoshop since Photoshop 2, and I don't yeah. mean see, I don't mean CS2, I mean two. Right, right. Um, long time. <laughs> so I use Lightroom to catalog stuff, but I really use Photoshop for all of my work because it's what I know. Right. Um, but it's not what I talk about. It's not what I write about. There are many, many people that are far better than I at explaining that stuff. 
I, I pick and choose what I use in there. It's simplistic, but it works for me. But what I do think I know a little bit about is composition. And uh, it's the same thing. Uh, the few times I do critiques anymore, I do them in class because people like them. But we, we, we approach it from a positive standpoint. So you're not just saying something stupid like, oh, the maker should have been closer. That drives me nuts. Um, well, maybe he didn't want it. Maybe he's afraid of grizzly bears. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll make a critique and it says, well, this I don't think works. And here's why. And if you don't do the here's why, your opinion is is invalid. So the first thing I tell people, first, it is an opinion. Uh, that's right. all it is. Uh, right. But it's based on some experience. And you know, the great thing about his opinions are you're free to take them or leave them. It's, totally. It, that, that works out pretty well when I do critiques. So that's the whole kind of thing with the newsletter. Um, I'll talk about subjects like photography as an art form and that old riff. Uh, I'm sure we're just tired of talking about that. But I may talk about things like, um, you know, the... In fact, I just recently did a representational versus artistic blog. You know, I'll, I'll do my five senses and six artistic senses. I'll do blogs on them. Um, then every couple of years, I'll repeat them, but with a new take. I just submitted sure. one to uh, NPN on Simplicity. It's going to run oh, the cool. end of the month. An awesome. Yeah, nice. I thought it was very cool. I mean, I joined yeah. that and I said, you know, I'm, if I'm going to belong to this, I might as well participate. So, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, definitely. I love that. It's a neat thing they're doing. I'm really glad to see them revive that because I never saw the original form of it. Yeah, it's way different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, earlier you had mentioned uh, Nampa just in brief passing. And I'm yeah. curious if you could tell us a little bit about your involvement with Nampa, what it is, and why it's an organization that you're a part of. So way back in the early 90s, when I was just getting started, um, there was uh, ASMP, there was PP of A, there was all these, uh, you know, um, what's the Magnum, all, all these agencies and groups that talk, that spoke for, for photographers. But there was nobody doing that for nature photography. And a bunch of my friends and I kept saying, Damn, there needs to be an organization for us. And then all of a sudden, we heard about the meeting that had taken place at the Roger Torrey Peters Institute in 1993. And lo and behold, there was an organization there all of a sudden. And I joined immediately, and I've been a member since. So, because it is the only group that speaks for us. And they do some things that we don't even notice. Um, through some of the members, especially Sean um, Fitzgerald, they've been fighting the fight on copyright um, and getting a lot of progress. So tr speaking for all creative artists' rights, which is really important, especially when you look what companies pay now. Right. And how many, you know, I, a friend of mine uses a legal service that's how he makes most of his money now. He does have this legal service that will do searches. They have some Hoodoo kind of software. They can find his images being used illegally. Yep. And one, yeah. he found out agency, some kind of creative agency that you would think knew better, but they had somebody designed something for him and it ended up on their logo and they were using it illegally. That's a nice um... payday for him. I use one myself and I just found a lawyer using one of my photos on his, on his website to promote yeah. his services. You would I'm think like, a lawyer would know better. Yeah, you would think a lawyer of all people would know better. Yeah. <laughs> they probably suspect that nobody's going to look for it. So, I know part of me was like, do I even yeah. want to try to challenge a lawyer? I'm oh, like, sure yeah. you do. Nothing yeah. else would give him grief. Uh, who would you recommend? For our podcast, who would you think our listeners would want to learn more about? Oh, got an hour? Um, <laughs> no, but you know, actually, one of the names. things one of the things I want to do with Nampa is there is a uh, history committee, and mm. there are guys that had 
really, really big names in the 90s and early 2000s and are retiring or worse. Um, and we want to get some of their recorded history. So I, I kind of am in that group. I'm kind of in between um, groups of photographers, between those guys that came up, mostly 4x5 shooters, um, guys like, well, Shaw didn't shoot 4 by guys like John Shaw and Larry Ulrich, and my buddy Will Clay, and, and uh, Rod Plank, all these guys that really created a business that allowed us uh, a leg in. And while digital changed everything, um, these are the same people that, that got all what I call the young bucks like you. There's so many great young photographers out there that, you know, I'm noticing on NPN that we're trying to get involved with NAMPA uh, regional events. Uh, that's another thing I'm doing with NAMPA is I, I help organize some of those. Um, and I might be talking to you. Okay. So, um, uh, so I, I would love to see you focus occasionally on some of those guys before they're no longer um, interviewable. Yeah, I know. Uh, specifically, you should really talk to my buddy Willard Clay. Um, Will's a great guy. Uh, like me, he's no, he's no short of opinions. But he's a great photographer. He's a really good guy. Huh? I said I love people that have yeah. opinions. Yeah, That's he does. Um, I think David Ward, if you could get him, would be incredible. Yeah. Out of the... Out of the UK for sure. All those guys, Cornish, you know, they're all good, especially David Cornish Ward. is coming up. We've already recorded. Is he? Hey, yeah, I yeah. will be listening to that. Um, so actually by the time people listen to this, it'll already be out, but yeah, oh, cool. actually technically you can listen to it today if you're a Patreon supporter, but yeah, I am. Yeah. So it is, it's on Patreon right now. I'll check that out. Yeah. So there, there's a couple, um, Craig Blacklock out of the, I don't know, Minnesota would be really, really great. Another guy okay. that he did a book on Lake Superior that is one of the finest pieces of publishing mm. I've ever seen. He circumnavigated it in a kayak for two oh, years wow. to produce That's that book. That's amazing. Yeah. That sounds awesome. <laughs> so cool. Those are some well, of Hank, my, my heroes. These are great suggestions. I'll do my best. <laughs> great. Do you need yeah, an introduction? Let me know. I know right. a few of them. I'll probably take you up on it. Awesome. Well, Hank, this has been super fun. I had great. a really great time. And um, thanks so much for spending the hour with us to share your knowledge. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, certainly. Uh, it, it's, to me, this is what, it, what it's all about. It's sharing stuff. So yeah, cool. that's another awesome. way of doing it. Love it. Cool. Great. Well, thank you to Hank for the very fun conversation with me on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. I love your idea of trying to get some of the more seasoned generation to come on the show. So if anyone can help with that, I would take it. Before we part ways, I wanted to remind listeners about a great opportunity to improve your photography over on Nature Photographers Network. NPN is one of the best platforms for improving your images because there is a dedicated and active audience of photographers at all levels participating in the critique forums over there. David Kingham, who owns NPN, has been pouring a lot of energy into improving the critiques over there. So if it's been a while since you visited, have another look. If you're new to NPN, you can join for just $49 per year by going to npn.link forward slash f-stop or by clicking on the link in the show notes. You can also use the code fstop10 for a 10% discount. I hope to see you there. Coming up on the show, we have a few great guests. First up, we have Walid Azami, a commercial photographer who is joining us to talk all about pricing your work. After that, we have Michelle Sons, a fine art photographer living in Virginia. I'm looking forward to both of those chats, so stay tuned to hear our engaging conversations. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.